The sun beats down on ancient Israel, a land caught between empires and the crossroads of civilization. The people of Israel, beleaguered by the oppression of the Philistines, cry out for a deliverer, someone to break the chains of their subjugation. Amidst this turmoil, a child is born, not just any child, but a Nazi right from the womb, destined for greatness. This is the beginning of the story of Samson, a man whose name would become synonymous with strength and whose hair would be as legendary as the feats attributed to him. The Chronicles tell us that Samson's birth was foretold by an angel, a messenger from God, to Manoah and his barren wife, who would later be named in the Book of Jubilees as Zelpanath. In the Book of Judges, the 13th chapter, it's recounted with a flourish befitting an epic. His mother, a woman of the tribe of Dan, promised that her son would be a Nazi rite unto God from the womb until the day of his death. The Nazi rite vow, a form of consecration mentioned in the Book of Numbers, required abstinence from wine, avoiding corpses and graves, and the refraining from cutting one's hair, symbolizing a life set apart for divine service. As Samson grew, so did the rumors of his strength. It was a strength that seemed superhuman, often likened to that of the heroes of old, those demigods of myth who could rival the feats of the gods themselves. Yet the secret of Samson's strength was his uncut hair, or was it truly? His hair was but the symbol of his covenant with God, a covenant that imbued him with might as long as he adhered to the Nazirite vows. The tale of Samson, as preserved in the Book of Judges chapters 13 to 16, does not attribute his immense strength to a demigod heritage, but rather to a divine blessing. The source of Samson's strength, according to the biblical narrative, is directly linked to the Nazirite vow that he took, or rather, that was taken on his behalf before his birth. Picture this. An angel of the Lord appears to Manoah and his wife, a woman who has been unable to conceive. The angel foretells the birth of a son who is to be a Nazirite from the womb. This Nazirite vow, detailed in Numbers 6, 1, 21, required abstaining from wine and strong drink, avoiding contact with the dead, and refraining from these restrictions were outward signs of an inward consecration to God. And in Samson's case, his uncut hair was a symbol of this vow and the source of his strength. In this context, Samson's power can be understood as a physical manifestation of his special covenant with God. It was not a power drawn from a divine lineage or the blood of the gods, as would be the case in Greco-Roman mythology or other ancient mythologies, but a gift from the God of Israel, contingent on Samson's adherence to his vow. His strength was as divine as the prophecies that foretold his birth, a divine favor granted for a divine purpose, to begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. Think of the setting in which this celestial announcement took place. The land of Israel, undulating with the ebb and flow of countless struggles, finds a moment of prophetic calm as an angelic visitor pierces the veil of the ordinary, stepping into the lives of Manoah and his wife, Zlelpanith. The narrative, as illuminated in the Book of Jubilees, gives us not just a promise of birth, but a forecast of destiny. Zlelpanith, a name that would later resonate through the hallowed scripts as the mother of one destined for consecration, must have stood in awe as the messenger of God outlined the life her son was to lead. In the cultural tapestry of the tribe of Dan, a group known for their warrior spirit and the depth of their prophetic insights, the vow of a Nazirite held a significance that transcended the individual. It was a commitment that spoke to the collective soul of a people seeking deliverance. The Nazi rite's abstinence from the pleasures and impurities of the world, like wine and death, was a physical manifestation of an inner purity, a holiness that was as much a part of the individual as it was of the community's collective identity. The notion of a life dedicated from womb to tomb to the service of God must have resonated profoundly within the hearts of those who heard it. Picture this, a gathering around the hearth the news of the angel's visitation spreading like wildfire, igniting hope and wonder in equal measure. Manoah's household, previously cloaked in the silent despair of childlessness, would become a beacon of divine intervention, a testament to the idea that from barrenness can come forth strength. Imagine Zlelpanith, amidst her daily toils, mindful of the divine injunction laid upon her and the child she was to bear. With each strand of hair that grew upon Samson's head, there was a tangible reminder of the vow, each lock a testament to the path he was ordained to tread. In a world where the echoes of God's voice were sought in thunder and whispers alike, the uncut hair of a Nazi rite spoke volumes. It was a living symbol, not only of the dedication of the individual, but also of the enduring hope of a people for redemption, a sign that God was indeed with them. 
The life of a Nazi right was set against the backdrop of a tumultuous time in Israel's history, a canvas where every brushstroke of the divine had significant implications. The abstention from wine was not just a personal sacrifice, it was a public declaration of divine dependence. The avoidance of corpses and graves marked not only a separation from death, but an affirmation of life, a life promised to divine purpose. Zlelpanith's son, Samson, would grow to embody this vow in a way that blurred the lines between man and myth. His life was a parable woven into the very identity of Israel, a story of divine promise cradled in the arms of human destiny. Each aspect of the Nazirite vow he took was a thread in the larger narrative of a people in need of a deliverer, a narrative that would find its ultimate expression in the extraordinary feats and failings of this Nazirite from birth, this man of God, this embodiment of Israel's hopes and fears. The tales of his exploits are numerous. Envision the undulating vineyards of Timnath, where clusters of ripe grapes hang heavily amidst the green. A hidden danger lurks, a fearsome lion, its mane like a crown of wild sunlight, its roar a terrifying symphony that even the bravest hearts could not ignore. Into this scene strides Samson, a man marked by God's favor, a solitary figure against the backdrop of pastoral beauty and lurking perils. The lion, embodying the untamed ferocity of nature, meets the embodiment of divinely endowed strength. This is no mere retelling of a hunter's bravado. It is the unfolding of a divine drama where raw power meets celestial purpose. The lion's attack is swift, a flurry of claw and muscle, a dance of death honed by instinct and hunger. The people of Timnath, accustomed to the idyllic rhythms of vineyard life, would have frozen at the sound, the roar a chilling reminder of the thin veil between civilization and the wild. But Samson, whose strength is as much a product of divine anointing as of his own sinew and bone, confronts the beast not with weapon or shield, but with the bare essence of his God-given might. Think of the astonishment that would have rippled through the onlookers, should any have been present. A man battling a lion as though he were partaking in a grim wrestling match, his hands instruments of a will mightier than his own. The struggle between man and beast echoes a deeper narrative, one where the forces of chaos and order clash, where the might of the oppressor is challenged by the God-appointed strength of the deliverer. Samson's victory over the lion is more than a feat of heroism. It is a signifier of his role as a champion of Israel, a living parable of God's power to conquer the seemingly unconquerable. And after the triumph, when the lion lay still, the vineyards of Timnath would once again be a place of peace, the air free of the scent of fear, replaced now with the aroma of grapes and the whisper of a promise kept. The defeated lion, a creature of might in its own right, becomes a symbol in the greater story of Samson, a testament to the power granted to him, and a prelude to the greater battles he would wage not only against beasts of the field, but against the very enemies of his people. Imagine the twilight hush over Philistine fields, an unsuspecting quiet before a spectacle of revenge as cunning as it is bizarre. As the last light of day wanes, an unusual procession is set into motion by a man whose wits match his strength. Samson, incensed by deception and betrayal, calls upon the wild foxes, creatures known for their cunning, to become the bearers of his retribution. Each fox, bound to another by the tail, becomes part of a tandem to which a torch is fastened. With the spark of fire, these creatures of stealth transform into agents of chaos, their panic and speed turning them into living flames that race through the unsuspecting fields. Think of the sudden blaze, a conflagration that starts as a flicker but soon swells into a roaring inferno. The fields of the Philistines, ripe with the season's bounty, become a sea of fire under the night sky. Each fox, its fear magnified by the blaze it cannot escape, dashes wildly, igniting everything in its path. The Philistines, whose hands wrought oppression, watch in horror as their sustenance is devoured by flame, their economic stronghold reduced to ash and ember. The sight of their livelihood disappearing into the night would sear into their memories a message of the cost of their enmity against the Israelites. This act of fiery sabotage by Samson is not a mere fit of rage, but a calculated stroke in the ongoing conflict between the Israelites and their oppressors. It is a dramatic display of resistance, a man using the elements of nature and the creatures of the earth to challenge the might of a dominant power. The scorched earth left in the wake of the foxes would bear witness to the lengths to which a divinely appointed judge of Israel would go to protect and avenge his people. The Valley of Sorek, where the vineyards roll in lush green waves and nestled among them, a figure of lethal allure. 
Delilah. Her name would become eternally woven into the legacy of Samson, not for acts of heroism, but for a betrayal as timeless as the tales of treachery themselves. Think of Delilah as the embodiment of Philistine grace, her beauty a sharpened blade concealed within a velvet sheath. As Samson lay his head upon her lap, the tendrils of love, or perhaps the exhaustion of constant vigilance, wove a lulling net around his senses. With each question she posed, Delilah probed the defenses of his heart, seeking the chink in his impenetrable armor. Three times she danced with her words, and thrice did Samson parry with deceptions of his own. It was a delicate game they played, one of trust and secrets, where the stakes were nothing less than life and power. The air in Delilah's chamber was heavy with the scent of perfumes and the unspoken tension of impending betrayal. With each false secret Samson revealed, the Philistine lords grew more impatient, their bribes and threats casting a shadow over Delilah's resolve. And each time her schemes failed to weaken Samson, her resolve deepened, as did the dangers that lurked behind her whispered entreaties. Finally, under the weight of Delilah's persistence, Samson's resolve crumbled like the walls of a besieged city. He disclosed the source of his strength, the Nazirite vow symbolized by his uncut hair. It was not mere hair that lent him might, but the sacred oath it represented, a covenant with God that had girded him with supernatural prowess. The Philistines acted with a cold, calculating precision. As the shears severed each lock of Samson's hair, so too were the ties to his divine empowerment cut. When he awoke, the Spirit of the Lord had departed from him, and he was as vulnerable as any other man. The strength that had defined him had evaporated into the ether, leaving him defenseless against his captors. Samson's descent was as precipitous as his rise had been meteoric. He, who had toppled pillars and slain armies, was now shackled and blind, the grist for his enemy's mill. In the grinding of grain, a task reserved for the lowest of slaves, the erstwhile judge of Israel found himself bereft of freedom and sight, but not of purpose. Even in his darkest hour, bound and humiliated, Samson's story was far from over. His fall from grace was as integral to his legend as his greatest victories. In Delilah's betrayal, the cycle of divine justice began to turn anew, setting the stage for redemption through ruin, and ultimately, the deliverance of a people. Samson's journey reminds us that strength is more than muscle and sinew. It is inextricably linked to the spirit and to the providence that guides the fates of men. Yet the story does not end here. As his hair began to grow, so did the return of his strength, a slow but steady resurgence of the favor he had once taken for granted. In his final act, during a celebration in the Temple of Dagon, where he was brought forth as an object of ridicule, Samson called upon God one last time. Pushing against the pillars of the temple with all his might, he brought the structure down upon himself and his captors, fulfilling his destiny as the deliverer of Israel through destruction and self-sacrifice. Samson's life, woven into the fabric of Israelite history, is as complex as it is dramatic. Was he a demigod, a man of myth and legend? Or was he merely a blessed warrior, his life a tapestry of human strengths and weaknesses, guided by the hand of God? Here, in the midst of Israel's struggles and the Philistine oppression, arises the enigmatic figure of Samson, his life a mosaic of mythic deeds and all too human frailties. Was Samson merely a man, chosen by God as a vessel for divine purpose, his incredible feats a manifestation of a power bestowed rather than inherent? Or was there something more to his lineage, a hint of the divine within his blood, as the tales of old might suggest? The very nature of his conception, a barren woman granted a child through the promise of an angel, echoes the motifs of divine intervention and miraculous births found throughout ancient lore. Think of Samson's purported demigod status, a notion that stirs the imagination with its heroic undertones. It conjures images of Herculean figures straddling the worlds of gods and men their exploits the fodder for stories that transcend generations. Yet, within the Hebrew tradition, the concept of a demigod is anathema. There is but one God, and he is indivisible, unshared by mortal consanguinity. Samson's strength was not the invincible might of mythic gods, but a sacred gift, conditional and covenantal. His power was as much a part of his covenant with God as the unshorn locks upon his head. The moment his hair was cut, the moment the vow was broken, his supernatural strength dissipated, revealing the mortal man beneath the legend.